Thank you for joining us at the EV Popularization Hong Kong Challenges and Opportunities webinar, co-organized by Invest Hong Kong and Business Environment Council, or BEC. I'm Wayne from BEC's policy and research team. This is the first webinar in the BEC and Invest Hong Kong Leadership Forum series, so please stay tuned for our future webinars. Now for a few housekeeping rules. Today's seminar will be recorded, so please feel free to revisit the content when the webinar is later uploaded to BEC's website and YouTube channel. Participants are all muted by default, and if you have any questions or comments for our speakers, please use the Q&A and chat functions at the bottom of the screen, and we will address them at the panel discussion at the end. So without further ado, may I please invite Mr. Richard Lancaster, the chairman of BEC, to give us his opening remarks. Richard, please. Yes, and, and Stephen, and uh, to all our guests today, welcome to uh, the first of our leadership series that's jointly organized with Invest Hong Kong. Uh, this one is on electric vehicles, and electric vehicles is a topic of great interest to BEC. Uh, not only is this part of the uh, what we call our uh, Sustainable Living Environment uh, Advisory Group's work, but we have a dedicated electric vehicle task force which has made recommendations, which have been, uh, some of which have been incorporated into the government's uh, EV roadmap. So uh, this afternoon, we have a very exciting uh, and very uh, knowledgeable panel of speakers uh, to talk about some of the challenges that we face with uh, electric vehicle rollout in Hong Kong. Uh, some of these we are quite familiar with, with uh, uh, ordinary passenger vehicles, but some of the more uh, difficult challenges are around commercial vehicles. So we'll hear from our panel of experts this afternoon on, on how we can overcome some of these challenges. So uh, on that note, I'd just like to uh, uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. A very warm welcome, and uh, I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Richard. May I also invite Mr. Stephen Phillips, Director General of Investment Promotion, Invest Hong Kong for a welcoming note. Please. Well, good afternoon, everybody. May I add my very warm welcome to this webinar. It really is a great pleasure to join you today. And I'm particularly delighted that we're working with BEC as part of this series um, of events. Needless to say, globally, climate change is one of the biggest issues that we face. And obviously, Hong Kong's commitment to net zero by 2050 is a very strong signal to the market about the importance that we're placing on it. At Invest Hong Kong, as a department of the Hong Kong SAR government, we really do believe that Hong Kong's net zero commitment and those of the country for 2060 will be a major, major driver of incremental foreign direct investment into the city and into the region. And so what we really want to do is work with businesses in Hong Kong to attract high quality solutions and businesses from all around the world to set up and grow in the city and crucially create high quality jobs. Um, obviously, transportation is a major um, emitter of pollutants, about 20% of carbon emissions, um, and that includes the whole range. But of course, not only do we have vehicles, we have the aviation industry and the maritime industry. Um, KS will be sharing with us the roadmap um, around electric vehicles. But from a business point of view, naturally, um, challenges is the other side of the coin to opportunities. And I think what we need to do is work together to turn these challenges into opportunity. Obviously, there are challenges, and I'm sure some of those will be brought out during the discussions today. We've got so many leading industry practitioners to share views about the implementation um, and unique characteristics of Hong Kong in deploying more electric vehicles. So I'm sure we're gonna to touch on some of the measures that are needed to make it happen, some that the public sector need to respond with, as well as the trends in EV battery development and EV charging that are gonna be crucial really for wider adoption over time. 
So thank you very much for joining us. We're delighted, as I said, to be working with BEC. And I certainly look forward to learning lots of new information this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And again, we would like to express our gratitude for Invest Hong Kong as the co-organizer of this webinar series. We would also like to thank the Hong Kong Productivity Council, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, and the Innovation and Technology Development Office at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University for putting organizations for this event. To kickstart the webinar, please welcome Mr. Andy Wong, Head of Innovation and Technology, Invest Hong Kong to share with us how to leverage Hong Kong to drive innovation and technology development. Andy, please. Thank you. So, um, good luck to you. One on the floor, and also good morning or good evening, uh, good afternoon for those on the webinar, depending on where you are. So today I'm going to talk about the innovation and technology development in Hong Kong, how the government is going to drive it. So for those who may not be familiar with Invest Hong Kong, we are the government agency to promote uh, foreign investment in Hong Kong. We have a global network of 31 office all over the world. And then we have a very strong ecosystem partnership with the government, with the technology park, and also with different associations as well. So uh, under the innovation and technologies, right, we can divide into different subsector, including biomedical, semiconductor, smart city, and telecoms, and also the other as well. Um, so under the smart city, we are very strong in the environmental. We look at it very seriously. So underneath that, we have a smart mobility and also smart environment, which all related to some sort of a car decarbonization and also a smart mobility as well. So in this case, um, under we are government, as we said before, we are very committed to carbon net zero by 2050. So we coming in four major pillars. One is the decarbonization covering the renewable energy. How are we going to store the facility and also the feed-in grid efficiency and also the energy efficiency using the IoT or smart meter and also the hydrogen economy under the green trans transportation. And I do believe that all people will aware that we are going to have a no more fossil um, new registration by 2035. And also for the electrical vehicle, commercial vehicle, we are starting to do all different kind of trials. And also the charging facility, we have the fund set up to do the EV charging as well. For the waste management, we are looking at the air and water pollution as well, how to control it. And also Hong Kong is very strong in financial. So we're looking at the green finance, the bond market, and also the stock exchange, really looking at how are we going to provide the platform to drive the green finance as well. So I'm an EV. So the song is that, what is the battery on the bus go round and round? So how are we going to make this battery going round and round in the city? We are thinking with six different things that we need to do it. So first of all, Hong Kong is very friendly to doing the business. The second is the R&D facility available in Hong Kong. And also we have the tenant in Hong Kong. And then we have the government support and also the, uh, the commercialization platform available and also the GBA synergy. So we talk about one by one each. For the Hong Kong to be doing business, right? Um, first of all, Hong Kong is in the central of Asia. So easy access to different country within five couple of hours, we can cover half population in the world. For the uh, tax, we have a simple and no tax rate and then two tier tax systems in Hong Kong. Capital fundraising, uh, we are the, for the last 10 years, we've been successful for the sixth number one IPO platform in the world. And we have a very strong IP system, including the registration part, the enforcement, and also the trading part in Hong Kong. And we are the freest economy worldwide. Um, we have no restriction on the foreign exchange. Uh, we are easy to do the, uh, all the bank support in, in Hong Kong. And we also have a very vibrant ecosystem for the startup. So we have the Start Me Up Festival coming up in May. So feel free to join. And then uh, there were lots of community around the investment community and also the PEVC fund available there. When we talk about the world-class infrastructure, we do have the two parks. One is the Science and Technology Park. The other is a cyber port and also six research institutions. So today we have the Hong Kong Productivity Council. Mr. Dr. Lawrence will come in to talk about the EV development as well. And then um, we talk about the talent. So um, six university in Hong Kong is ranked the top 100 in worldwide. And also uh, different university, they do have their technology transfer office, which is going to leverage or commercialize the technology through licensing models or through collaboration models or contract consultancy models as well. Uh, we have a lot of government support funding available in Hong Kong. So as you can see on this uh, chart, right? So you can see that 
on the lift that the R&D and technology adoption quite significantly, uh, including the funding available from the Science Park and also from the Cyber Port. And also within the environmental, we do have different funding to drive the smart uh, traffic fund as well. Uh, in terms of the funding, if we look at the, the whole cycle for development, starting from the startup stage to research and development, and then to the adoption, you can see we have different funding or incubation program available to drive this development. Say, for example, in the science part, we have different incubation programs. For the R&D, we have different matching fund. We have the R&D capital expenditure rebate or cash rebate. And also we have the talent research hub, which is going to subsidize the, uh, the salary for those people who are employed for the R&D functions, right? And also we have the adoption phase moving to the commercialization. When we talk about the commercialization, government do have different portals, right, to support it, like the uh, e and you know, portal, the uh, Smart Government Innovation Lab, and also the government itself, when, do, when we do the procurement, we do not just purely look at the price, but we also look at the technology factor in order to when we make the decision for procurement. So all those is going to drive the commercialization. Last but not least, we talk about the uh, Greater Bay Area. So the whole idea is that the nine plus two city in the Greater Bay Area is we are going, how are we going to combine Hong Kong, Macau, and also the nine city in uh, mainland China to stimulate the synergy around that. So leveraging the, the industrial power in the mainland city in particular, and also the Hong Kong financial support. So the, the overall strategic intent is to drive the innovation, increase our international competitiveness, and also to do the commercial part, we build a strong manufacturing and logistic hub in Hong Kong, and then improve the center of living in Hong Kong. So the overall idea is that we, have a, we can do a very fast prototype, good design, scale up the manufacturing, and also we can help to go global using the uh, world-class logistic network in Hong Kong. So um, if you can see this, right? So the one side is about the Greater Bay Area. We have different industrial cluster available in Greater Bay Area. Because we have a continued policy developed in the Greater Bay Area, we have the capital flow in policy driven, and then with leveraging Hong Kong, the business environment. And then we have the connection between Hong Kong and Greater Bay Area through the connected infrastructure and the facility measure available in between the two parts in the world and also the technology enabled to make it happen. So Hong Kong play a very strategic role in this area. So you can see that the whole um, 9 plus 2 city, Hong Kong, stand out to be very high in GDP in terms of the GDP, which is in par with Macau or Shenzhen is catching up as well. So the role to pay is that you can see different city in the mainland can combine Hong Kong together. It can be, for example, in the Guangzhou and Hong Kong, it can be a shared center. And also with different city around, with different GDP, we can become a powerhouse in terms of manufacturing, leveraging Hong Kong, the uh, financial center status, in this case. And then another one, apart from the science park, we do have the Hong Kong Shenzhen Innovation Park, so which is uh, about three to four times biggest in size compared to the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park, which is located in the Lok Majo Loop, so which is across the border to, to the China border. And then um, it's serving 87 hectares in terms of land size. And then the whole idea will be in the two different phases of development. So the phase one will be 31 buildings, and then later on will be 36 buildings, covering six major areas, including the health tech technologies, AI, big data, robotics, new materials, electronics, and fintech as well. So this is the, the picture about how it looks like in the future. So uh, you can see the land over there, very nice design. To sum up, so um, here is the overall, the summarize of what I've been trying to talk about. So from the basic research, we have the university and then the R&D development, we have different technology park and research institutions to support it. When it comes to the commercialization, um, we do have the advanced manufacturing center coming up to support it. And also we have the industrialization happening. From the government side, we do have a lot of different funding to support it, to drive it, and the business environment in Hong Kong is very well fit for doing the business uh, global compared to global. So we have the GBA to support it at the back. So I hope that I finish here. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for setting the scene and explaining in a broader context, the innovation and technology landscape in Hong Kong. Up next, shifting our focus to today's topic of electric vehicles. We have Dr. Lawrence Chang, the Chief Innovative 
the Chief Innovation Officer of Hong Kong Productivity Council, who will share with us the challenges of commercial deployment of electric vehicles in Hong Kong. Lawrence, please. And um, welcome to uh, this uh, uh, seminar webinar. I think uh, I know that we have audience from uh, all over the world and uh, welcome to, to Hong Kong uh, in a way. Uh, today, I, I have to, I have drawn a good card that I only talk about the challenges of uh, deployment of uh, commercial deployment of EVs. And then I think uh, the speaker after me will probably talking about the solution and some of the, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the roadmap of how we're going to do it. So first, I think we start to look at some of the numbers of uh, the transportation in Hong Kong. Uh, in Hong Kong, we have 800, about 800,000 licensed vehicles in Hong Kong in such a small place. That's why we have uh, lots of traffic jam and the roads are all jammed up and a lot of our roads are actually quite narrow. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about, it, uh, about that later on. And then um, we have uh, about 18,000 licensed electric vehicles uh, in Hong Kong and amongst them, uh, about 18,200 of them are private EVs, that is the private cars EVs. And um, by that, I think we look at the bigger picture. I I, before I came, um, I got some number, which I think is too many to put on the screen. Uh, in Hong Kong, uh, in terms of public bus, we have about 6,000 public buses. Uh, we have taxi, about 18,000 taxi. Um, for minibus or light bus, we have about 4,000 light bus in Hong Kong. And for goods vehicles, we have about 120,000. So all in all, we have a large number of vehicles in Hong Kong. And for new vehicles registered or licensed every uh, month, we have about one in every eight to one in every 10 of them are electric vehicles, private electric vehicles. And in that respect, we are not doing, very, uh, not doing uh, badly in, in a way of uh, deployment of electric vehicle in the private car area. A lot of uh, people were, are actually considering to, uh, to buy more about electric vehicles rather than gas gasoline vehicles. So in that respect, we are not doing, uh, not doing badly in that uh, area. But in area of um, uh, commercial electric vehicle, uh, you can see on the screen that our deployment is relatively low. We have about 40 electric buses. Most of them are in trial or in, um, in uh, pilot use. We have 155 uh, electric goods vehicle. And in terms of electric taxi, we do not have any. Then people may, we may uh, want to ask the question, why it is so difficult to deploy uh, electric vehicle in a commercial manner in Hong Kong? Then I'll probably give you some of the more broad view of what Hong Kong is like. Firstly, Hong Kong, we have very heavy traffic. We do not have a lot of wide and open road. Most of the road are suburban road and uh, we, are not, we have a lot of build up area. That's why we are always jam packed in traffic, particularly during peak hours during the, during the morning and also in the afternoon. Our, our streets are mostly very crowded, particularly in the city area where we have cars and pedestrian and everybody are fighting for the same piece of, small piece of land or small piece of road. So we are all fighting. And uh, then the road are usually quite narrow. And whenever there's any free space on the road, they are always taken up by something, either by illegally parked car or by some uh, bicycle or motorcycle or something. It's always being occupied in that way. And the other thing is that Hong Kong is quite hilly, particularly in the Hong Kong Island, where uh, we, we, are, we are in a, in a place where in the, um, what we call the mid level or or even further up, uh, we do have a lot of steep terrain where if we want to deploy electric vehicle, we need to take specific uh, uh, care in that respect. And the other thing is that Hong Kong is quite small. If you are driving a car north to south, east to west, when there is no traffic, we can go uh, around it in half an hour. Uh, when we have heavy traffic, it's another thing. So most of the time, our trip in terms of distance is actually quite short. In Hong Kong, the bus, I actually did some research. In Hong Kong, the longest bus route in Hong Kong is 73.5 kilometer, single trip, one way. This route N42A, for those of you who are interested, is between, I think, the airport and uh, in the new territories. And the shortest bus trip is 1.6 kilometer. 
So most of the bus trip may be about 20 and 30K. And the range of uh, buses every day is about 300K or so. Um, and then on the other side, for taxi, uh, we have very high utilization of taxi. The taxi usually we have two, um, we have, we have, we have two shifts. One shift in the morning and the other shift in the afternoon or nighttime. And they usually change the shift around at around four o'clock, three o'clock. And they usually stop for one hour. And the taxi driver, they chit chat and wash the car, fill up with the uh, uh, gas, uh, LP gas in Hong Kong. And um, that's why the utilization is very high. We don't have a lot of time for the taxi to charge up uh, if we are using electric vehicle for the taxi. So the taxi itself is a problem that we need to solve in terms of the utilization. And finally, air conditioning. Hong Kong is hot and humid during the summer. So as a result, we have high demand on air conditioning. Now for private cars or taxi is okay. We maybe the range may be shortened a little bit, but for buses, particularly double decker buses, then the actual demand on uh, air conditioning may significantly shorten the actual range of the bus. So as a result, the range of, let's say some of the double, double decker bus now available in the market now, maybe uh, 250 or 300K of range. With air conditioning, it can decrease down to below 200. So if you are thinking, we, we are thinking about charging the bus once, and have it run for the whole day, it's almost impractical to do it that way. So what are the challenges in Hong Kong? So I, I basically summarize it in uh, six different aspects. First thing is the cost. The cost in acquiring an electric vehicle commercially, the commercial electric vehicle, uh, is actually about sometimes 50% or sometimes 80% more expensive than the, petrol, and then the uh, fossil fuel counterpart. And now Hong Kong is very good. We, our, the, the, our government, they actually give our subsidies in some deployment as a uh, pilot measure that the government pay the difference between the electric uh, commercial vehicle and the, and the fossil fuel counterpart. Now, that is good in a way because uh, we can allow the uh, allow, the, uh, allow the, the industry to try out electric vehicle and how good they are and all that. But the problem is that we, the government cannot subsidize it all the time. And eventually uh, the, the industry uh, will ask the question on the return, return on investment in terms of how much fuel they would cost, in terms of how much operation cost that they would, uh, they would, they would save. And in that respect, I think at this moment, the, uh, the cost model is still not very sound. The second thing is charging. In Hong Kong, it's very difficult to set up electric charging, electric vehicle charging infrastructure for commercial vehicle, mainly because as I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned the, uh, the problem we have uh, in terms of uh, very narrow streets, even bus stop, we are all filled up with buses for the minivan and light van. They are all triple park, double park vans. On, on the but on the on the terminal, so as a result, we don't have place to fit uh, a charging infrastructure there. So it is very difficult in 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 terms of safety and in terms of the setup of the electric charging infrastructure. So um, so that's why we need to think of some alternative. I will mention it a bit later on. Thirdly, is the maintenance. Now, I mean, we have been using a lot of pilot scheme and all that. And as a result, the actual number of these uh, commercial electric vehicles are not many in Hong Kong. So as a result, if you have a breakdown, then nobody will be able to, to fix it. In some, in some instance, I heard some years ago, some of the electric buses deployed in Hong Kong, if they break down, they need to tow back to, to mainland China to have it fixed. And once they are fixed, of course, they are towed back to Hong Kong. And that is not ideal. I mean, in a, in a real deployment, that would not work. Fourthly is the range. As I mentioned, in Hong Kong, although the place is small, it's actually quite ideal for the deployment of electric vehicle. But the problem is that uh, for a lot of uh, reasons, like for uh, double-decker buses and all that, or for electric uh, taxi, um, the utilization is high. The demand on the, the, uh, the power from air conditioning is high. So the range itself is not sufficient for a viable operation of the electric vehicle in Hong Kong. 
So the, the, uh, the fifthly is the standard. A lot of the charging standard at the moment, they are actually not standard. Uh, a lot of the, uh, for commercial vehicle, for electric vehicle, they usually use very high power standard, sorry, high power charging. And for those, they are mostly using proprietary standard. So as a result, um, we cannot interchange them. So we have one make of bus using one standard of EV charging and another standard of buses using different kind of standard for charging. And finally, availability. At this moment, uh, the availability is still not uh, comparing to, let's say, diesel buses or uh, fossil fuel uh, electric vehicle, uh, commercial vehicle are still not comparable uh, to the, uh, the electric vehicle counterpart. What I mean is the electric vehicle counterpart is not as good as the other side. So that is something that is hindering. So because my, I'm running out of time, I so quickly some of the suggestions that I have is that we need to put in more personnel training to because the maintenance and the repair of commercial electric vehicle is very, very different to the repair of commercial fossil fuel vehicles. So we need to provide training for the people involved to get them up to speed with EVs. Uh, sanitization I mentioned just now, alternative charging, I'll probably mention it in the next slide. Finally, is the increased scale. I think if we want to really uh, uh, push for the electric vehicle commercial deployment, I think we need to increase the scale of our trial. We cannot have only a few vehicles or a few taxi. We may need to have maybe a certain region of Hong Kong to, um, to deploy and trial certain electric vehicle in the commercial way like taxi. And if we increase scale, we can tell more about the problem. And also we can tell what kind of standard would be suitable and what kind of charging regime will be suitable. Now, this is uh, my second, second uh, last slide. I think for charging is no longer practical to charge just one charge every day at night it wouldn't be practical because we just, just don't have enough place to put uh, the charger and also don't have enough place to put all the commercial electric vehicles. So we need to have different charging mechanism. We may need to set up some sort of, some sort of gantry or pantograph like what you see on the screen, or maybe some mobile charger that we charge on demand that the charging itself uh, would be done with a mobile uh, machine or mobile electric vehicle charger that the charger will move next to the bus or next to the electric vehicle when it's in, when it's in demand for charging. So finally, the takeaway, it's not a trivial problem. Otherwise it would have been solved. It, it, will, it will demand a lot of different aspects of development in terms of the business model, in terms of technology. And I think we need some time. As I said, we need new technology in terms of the battery, <laughs> in terms of the charging infrastructure and all that. Thirdly, I think the, the actual routine and habit, we need to change that because as a, as a fossil fuel or petrol uh, uh, car driver, you usually would run out of petrol before you go and fill up your, your, your car. And uh, it will be what, at least one or two weeks or for, for more heavily used maybe every week. But for charging electric vehicle, then we may need to do something like opportunistic charging. That is, whenever there's an opportunity to charge it, you charge it. Then you would not let it to run dry before you charge it. So the actual habit of how you do it will be quite different. Fourthly and finally, we need to build up a critical mass. Without a critical mass, we, a lot of things would not work. So with, in terms of the charging infrastructure, in terms of the repair, maintenance, personnel, and all that. So that concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence, and your very concise overview of the situation electric commercial vehicles are facing in Hong Kong, which also segues nicely into our next presentation. Look in, breakthroughs and challenges for electric vehicles. From a more technical point of view, may I now invite our next speaker, Professor Eric Chang, Professor at the Department of Electrical Engineering, Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Eric. Good afternoon. Thank you so much to attend my <laughs> So today uh, we're trying to go for some technology we'll be working on in poly use. So, to, so today we go for a number of technology we're trying to work on, including some battery technology and including some electrical vehicle technology and also some new component as well. 
So of course, energy management will be so important. We also go through them as well. So you all know that there will be the petrol ban in a number of places. So that's why we have to go for yes vehicle. I think there will be no U-turn anymore. So what we need to do now is to look into different kind of technology we can now working on. So in here, we have different kinds of technology, including some power conversion, power electronic, and battery system, motor system, and many other technology we need to promote in EV so they can make it happen, can make the vehicle more effective. So nowadays we are been working on different kind of research projects, trying to tackle each one of the area. So in the past, probably you have been working on different kind of technology. In here, you can see that we got some solar golf car and also some so-called my car, the two-seater vehicle, and also some kind of competition vehicle like the solar vehicle as well. So one of the technology we like to talk to you would be called the solar powered air conditioning system. Air conditioning is one of the issue for all the vehicle because you consume energy, you can consume quite a good percentage as well. But using the solar power, you should able to provide portion of energy, but not everything may be a portion. That portion can be a few percent to tens of the percentage. So that will be quite a good thing. We make use of the MPPT, so-called maximum power point tracking. So this method, we can able to get most of energy from PV panel and power up to the air conditioning system together with the battery energy storage. So right here, we build up a number of vehicles, like some and Kenta, lorry and minibus, taxi and private vehicle as well. So in here, we also implement on seven Coca-Cola vehicle and more some engine vehicle and more some taxi and minibuses. So they all working really well. We're able to provide a really good percentage of energy and they actually have been used in the market for a number of years now. So we also working with some students, ask them to understand more about the vehicle. Here will be some sort of the uh, power conversion technology we build up on EV, putting the EV and how to build up the vehicle so that they learn the technology of the electrical uh, applications. So another technology we try to work on is so-called linear compression. More it is because for many of the EV components, we do have a lot of the linear motion, including the air conditioning system, the compressor, Conventionally, we use the centrifugal method to do that, but this method may not be too effective because if the efficiency will be a bit poor, so we try to move on to linear compression. In this case, the efficiency will be much, much better. We use this method has been applied in attic expansion and also in air conditioning system. So one of the things we did was putting them on air conditioning system. So you can see that by using this technology, and we also develop a new kind of motor technology so that we're able to move them all to, together. We found that efficiency has been improved by, by a good percentage, up to about 30% efficiency compared to conventional compressor. And our technology we work on the so-called the wheel motor. In wheel motor, that means we try to combine the motor to get the wheel to together. So in this case, the wheel itself has power. In theory, if you put two motors there, become a two-wheel drive, we can use the skid steering to do the, all the turning without going through the angle steering. In this case, we can eliminate most of the mechanical part as well. The efficiency is really good, the controllability also good as well. For example, like in here, you can see that the motor we use there are highly effective. We don't have to use PM permanent magnet. In this case, it's only silicon iron and copper wire. So the motor itself with really low cost. You can see the vehicle we built up there. We have no shroud, no gearbox, no clutch, no transmission. So the vehicle itself, only battery and the wheel can become a VV. You can see that in the future, if you go for any smart steering or any smart vehicle or also autonomous driving, then we don't want to rely on mostly mechanical portion. We also want to rely mainly on electrical control because much faster. We eliminate all the mechanical part. So the vehicle will be cheaper, easier to control as well. So all the autonomous driving vehicle we now develop are all using this kind of so-called skid steering. Another thing will be called active suspension. At the suspension is the vehicle we talked about in the past, all the vehicle now, they, we use hydraulic suspension together with some spring. In this case, you can see that the motion control is not very really good. When the vehicle passes for a ramp, obviously you can see some vibration. 
because we can't control the vertical acceleration really well. We need to cancel the vertical acceleration due to RAM. So because hydraulic and electrical spring and normal spring, you can't do that really well, even though we got an active motor to drive the hydraulic is not good enough. So that's why we developed this linear motor. So this linear motor actually will be replaced all the hydraulic system become vertical motion. So in this case, this is motor design. We can see that we use a full winding to do the job. So we're able to provide the vertical movement. The dynamic response is much, much better than conventional methods. So here you can see that we're putting that into the fall of the suspension in the vehicle. We're able to eliminate all the vibration. The good thing is when the vehicle go for any RAM, all the energy can absorb it due to the vibration can convert into the battery. So that's why you can have additional energy storage. Another thing we're looking on would be wireless charger. We all know the charger is so important. We need to develop some sort of charger which is able to provide a good support to the battery. So to do this one, of course, the conventional method will be using this called a resonant magnetic. So which we use resonant circuitry to convert from primary side to the secondary side. So to do this one, we have to use a number of the circuitry to do the conversion. In this case, we're able to control the frequency, control the distance, control the power flow. So this is some of the circuit we've been working on. And we're also working on different kinds of coil, the best coil we can, can develop on the vehicle. So one coil will be on the vehicle, one coil will be on the ground so that we're able to do the power transfer. So we're from a final element so that the image you can see over there, we can work out the best method to create the coil design. So we've been working on this in the laboratory. So you can see that on the surface, there will be low surface and the top will be the vehicle. So we can able to see how the vehicle travel on the road. We can move and charge. That means when the vehicle is moving, driving, we can still charge the vehicle as well. Another mechanism we're working on called the battery management system. So the important because the battery is important, we need to manage the battery so that we can able to provide the battery the best environment to work on. So that's to say the battery really understand is state of charge, state of health in the two important condition. We also need to protect battery from being damaged because all the battery cannot be identical. So we need to make sure that all the battery cell can be well on a good environment. To do this one, we have created a BMS system, which some of the portion will be trying to balance all the battery cell. That means each of battery cells to be equal condition. Why are we doing that? Because you can see that if I've got 100 of battery cells connected in series, if one of the two of the cells being overcharged, the whole set will be damaged. Why is that? Because the cell cannot be burned all the time. To do this one, we need to burn all the cell, make sure under the charge and discharge condition, they're all equal. We also protect the battery not being too much under charge and overcharge and current temperature, and everything we need to monitor. So that's called the BMS system. So develop this system together with other supercapacitor system as well. So another technology we try to work on for tomorrow will be called the body integrated supercapacitor. Why it is because we make the supercapacitor integrate with the body part of the vehicle. So in the past, we use battery, but battery is more chemical, it's difficult to integrate with the battery, with the body. But however, today the supercapacitor is really safe, even though we punch through is no problem as, as well. So we're able to integrate the package of the battery, the package of supercapacitor together with body part. So here you can see that some of the portion like the door, like the roof like, and the ring, you can integrate with supercapacitor. That is to say the body cell will be the energy storage. We don't need to have separate box to contain the battery or supercapacitor. You can see that all the vehicle, you got big box or big structure become the energy storage. That's a, such a waste. But because many of the packaging, we can share them. So that's why we come up with this idea for the supercapacitor board integration. That's how it look like. So the body itself, that the roof, each part we will contain with our supercapacitor. The good thing is able to charge quite rapidly. And in the future, if you want to do so-called configurable electric vehicle, that means the vehicle can be changed the shape. Then each of the part have their own energy storage, have their own motion control. In this case, you can change the vehicle to any shape without any difficulty. In the past, all the energy stored in the box. So if you want to change the shape, like the, like the net go, we want to change them, it's impossible. But today we can do that using this body integration. So another thing we work on called the ABS anti-lock braking system. 
In the past, all the analytic system are controlled by a server company, by the patent, but they're all using hydraulic system. In the past, one hydraulic can, they control a four of the brake for each the wheel. In this case, it's not really uh, safe. So if one of the hydraulic system broken, then all the wheel braking will have a big problem. So what we like to do using a force motor to control each of the wheel. Today, the force motor, only a very, very small one can provide a few tons of the force. So we can optimize the performance for the vehicle at that maximum point of the friction. In this case, we're able to control the ABS anti-lock braking system. So that has been done. So we implement them on the single wheel, that means one quarter vehicle. And so you can see the top will be the wheel, the bottom will be the roll. We try to implement it in, in, in the lab. So it's really successful. We also get the Geneva Award as well. So that's how you look like. I'm not quite sure we can do that in here because if you press the button, it's able to play the video. If someone can help me to press the button for that back window, I'm not quite sure if we can do that. Then you're able to see the moving. Anyway, so. So in here, you, you supposedly we can able to see the motor being rotate and, and rotate this so as the power braking system. So end of braking system is so important for all the EV development, but actually for all the motor development as well. Another thing we work on will be the extended range for the using fuel cell. In the past, fuel cell only using hydrogen, but that's not very good because hydrogen actually has some problem. If you want to use hydrogen on some highway or the bridge or tunnel, we maybe have problem. So we tend to use ammonia. Ammonia is much safer. We don't need to use 700 bar of the hydrogen storage, only use eight bar, it's much easier to handle. And also ammonia have a low carbon there, completely low carbon, much easier to handle. Energy content will much, much higher than other. So build up this vehicle using ammonia as the energy to power up the, our fuel cell. So that's how our fuel cell vehicle look like. We use ammonia and pass through a cracker and fill up the fuel cell system and power the motors. So that's how we design for the vehicles. So that's how we try to going to implement on a minibus. That's a, that would be a, a seven meter one. So that means you can see that our technology using here, we try to eliminate most of the hydrogen unit. We try to use ammonia. We try to implement the cracker technique. We try to implement the fuel cell technique, energy storage technique. We combine the battery to get the ammonia fuel cell, become a more effective hybrid system. So to conclude, we can see that we have proposed a number of new technology for EV. I think the technology for tomorrow includes the solar power, all electric ABS, and also fuel cell technology, email mode, and active suspension. So we're going to implement them on all on future EV. So hopefully you like my presentation for future technology for EV. Thank you then. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Next, moving from a technical angle to the policy angle. We are very honored to have the Secretary for the Environment, Mr. K.S. Wong, to give us a keynote speech on the government's roadmap on the popularization of electric vehicles, which was published just earlier this year in March. Yes, please, the floor is all yours. Good, Stephen. Thank you for organizing this uh, very timely event. Uh, the Hong Kong government launched Hong Kong's first ever EV roadmap uh, in March. Um, it's a very good to see the industry, the business sector, the investors, uh, the academia to talk more about how we can meet these local challenges, also offer solutions and opportunities. It's not only about the environment, also about business, also about investment, about clean air, and also about decarbonization, about smart city and smart investment. Today, I would like to share with you uh, what's the key elements within the Hong Kong roadmap on popularization of electric vehicles. There are various public concerns. Firstly, about private cars. Are there enough incentives? Are there enough support? Secondly, as highlighted by uh, Lawrence, about commercial vehicles and also public means of transportation, including franchise buses. There are many challenges. Third, about the charging facilities for pirate cars and also for other commercial vehicles. 
are the subsidies enough, particularly in private housing estates? Because in Hong Kong, many people are not in, uh, say, the US, uh, many people in Hong Kong are living in high density, high rise estates. And training, as highlighted by some other speakers, is very important. And also about the battery, and also battery re recycling. Last but not least, not only about EV, but also other new energy vehicles, how about hydrogen vehicles, etc. The roadmap highlighted six key elements. Firstly, about green and decarbonization, innovation, and cooperation in Hong Kong and also the Greater Bay Area. Secondly, about the electric pirate cars. Third, about the commercial vehicles and also public uh, means of transportation. Fourth, about charging network. Fifth, about maintenance services. Last but not least, about battery recycling. We said that overall target is by 2050, zero vehicular emissions is to echo Hong Kong's carbon neutrality patch that we have to meet the carbon neutral target before 2050. That's about zero carbon emissions, clean air, and also smart city. Okay, about the six elements. Firstly, about the pirate vehicles. As highlighted by Lawrence, Hong Kong's performance is not too bad. In fact, it's one of the best in Asia. For Yi Pirate Cars, last year, every eight Leo Pirate Cars, one was EV. This first quarter, this spring, one out of seven. I can tell you that this is the highest ratio among all big cities in Asia. The government provide incentive about the taxation, about uh, other support so that people would buy more new pirate vehicles. Certainly, it's not easy. The charging facility is one of the bottleneck that I can tell you more later. Also, there's other challenge is that in Hong Kong, the public means of transportation is very good. More than 90% of people's daily commuting is using public means but some people still need private vehicles. So we'd like to control the total number of private vehicles. So we introduced that one for one scheme, replacement scheme to provide incentive to new private EVs, 90%, more than 90% of people, when they have the new EV, they use the one for one scheme. So on one hand, we promote more E private vehicles, at the same time, try to control the total number of pirate cars in Hong Kong. Secondly, about commercial vehicles. Again, as highlighted by Lawrence, it's very challenging in Hong Kong, given Hong Kong's topography, climate, and also intensity of usage. It's not easy. So in brief, according to this roadmap, we are going to make the best use of the forthcoming, say, five years to have trials for almost each type of common e commercial vehicles in Hong Kong, including franchise buses, not only single deck, but also double decker buses in Hong Kong. Because the real challenges for franchise buses transformation in Hong Kong is about double deckers. About 95% of Hong Kong's franchise buses are double deckers. And the challenge is pretty unique given Hong Kong's hilly topography, and also high humidity and hot weather in long summers. We are also to try out the so-called public light bus in Hong Kong. It's something, again, you need in Hong Kong. So we are working with the industry to have trials in Hong Kong. First, about taxi. Taxi drivers in Hong Kong are very hardworking. They are working days and nights and almost more than 20 hours a day. And we are going to work with them to have trials in certain localities in Hong Kong so that we can get more solid experience in these coming few years. We are also subsidizing the industry to try out different lorries, even motorcycles in the coming year so that within these few years, we can get more and better experience 
about these commercial and public vehicles so that we can formulate the next roadmap. Because the big approach is that we would about say each five years, we would update and review the EV roadmap. First about charging facilities, there are probably two aspects. One is for the pirate vehicles. We have two schemes. For all or most new developments, about 10 years ago, we have an incentive scheme through the four area concession to provide incentive to developers when they decide and build their new developments, they should make their estates EV ready. Most developers buy in. On the other hand, the existing estates are problematic because when they were built, they were not EV ready. So last year, we launched Hong Kong's uh, new subsidy scheme because the EV charging at home scheme. The response is pretty good. Originally, we expect to upgrade about 60,000 parking space in private estates in three years. But by now, just within about half a year, about 400 estates submitted the, their application. It's about 90,000 parking space already. So with these two schemes, on one on new buildings, the others on existing buildings, we estimate that within a few years, say three years, more than 150,000 parking space in the private residential estates or so will become EV ready. It's a pretty high ratio because in Hong Kong, in the private residential estates, the total parking space should be about 300,000. So if we can transform about 150,000 within a few years, it's pretty impressive. At the same time, we understand that some people still rely on public charging facilities. So through the public sector and private sector, we expect that more than 5,000 parking space with charging facilities will be ready within a few years. At the same time, we are going to install or consider quick charging network through say the existing petrol stations, because we expect that the EV popularization would make some of those petrol stations outdated so that we can make use of some existing petrol station site for quick charging. Fourth about training is very important because we need different uh, skill set so that we are working with the post-secondary institutes and universities on training, on research, so that we can make our human resources ready for the EV popularization. And then about the battery recycling, when there are more electric vehicles, we need to make better handling of those uh, old batteries from EV. So on one hand, we're working with, with Trey, at the same time that we are considering a new law, uh, we call the eco responsibility law, so that most of those retired EV batteries can be in better handling and use. At the same time, we are making use of our new wind tech fund to support R&D on decarbonization and also environmental production, including the second life applications of EV batteries in the, uh, among our priority firms uh, to be su supported by the wind tech fund. Last but not least, it's about the en new energy vehicles. We understand that Hong Kong is territory is tiny, so that the most of the electric vehicles should be good enough for daily traveling. For, for instance, for my own EV, it only need recharging every few days, even though I travel a lot around the town for my uh, duties. But at the same time, we set up a new task force within the government, not only from the environmental production department, but also from the relevant departments like the five services and others so that we can have a group of colleagues within the whole government to examine what are the high-end development of new decarbonization technologies globally and regionally, including new energy vehicles and field technologies like the hydrogen uh, vehicles, so that we can prepare and also to plan for that. Regional collaboration is also important. The Great Bay Area offers us opportunities 
like Fusan in uh, the Great Bay Area region is the hub for hydrogen in China. So we are looking closely with them so that we can also make the relevant population and plan for that, particularly for commercial vehicles, because many of the commercial vehicles from Hong Kong and the other cities in the Great Bay Area are traveling within the region. So if there are changes in the other parts of the Great Bay Area, Hong Kong has to be ready. Last but not least, it's about smart city. There are many opportunities for investment and opportunities. It's not only about getting up the air, not only about using uh, new energy vehicles, but also we can make use of the latest technologies, big data, et cetera, so that we can prepare for a new mode of mobility for the future, like autonomous driving and other uh, technologies in smart mobilities. I would like to end here, but I would like to say that the EV popularization is very important for our future, clean air, decarbonization, and also offer many investment and business opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, KS, for the comprehensive overview of the roadmap and the proposed government initiative. Now let us move on to the panel discussion that will be focused on providing charging solutions to electric commercial vehicles, which are a major source of greenhouse gas emissions and roadside air pollution. Again, if you have any questions for this, first, type your questions using Please introduce our moderator for today, Mr. Benjamin Wong, Head of Transport, Infrastructure and Advanced Manufacturing at Invest Hong Kong. Now, I'll now pass the time to you, Benjamin. Thank you, thank you, Wayne. Uh, now, uh, let me introduce our uh, panelists uh, here this afternoon first. Uh, we have uh, Gary, Mr. Gary Leung from uh, KMP, Head of Operational Planning. Uh, we have uh, Keith, um, Keith Wong from uh, Siemens, uh, Head of Digital Business and uh, Smart Infrastructure. And then Keith, Keith Wu, um, he is from Hong Kong EV Power, General Manager. Uh, so it's actually fantastic to have uh, these three panelists because we have um, the actual user of the electric vehicles, um, the turnkey solution provider, and also the, the technology uh, enabler. So it's, um, it's great. Uh, the only challenge to the, this time is actually the timing because we have only 25 minutes. And uh, it's actually a very big topic. Um, so uh, I will um, structure this into first, I'll give uh, each of the uh, three panelists uh, two minutes um, to give us their own roadmap um, of their business in Hong Kong. Uh, and then we will have uh, another main discussion on the obstacles and challenges uh, here facing in Hong Kong. Uh, and then in the end, hopefully we will be able to have a sort of uh, uh, interactive discussion, uh, if possible, uh, a debate on the, what would be the biggest uh, obstacle uh, for us to achieve that. Uh, now, with uh, further ado, uh, maybe each of you uh, please give us uh, uh, two minutes of um, outlining the roadmap, uh, Gary, on the electrification of the, uh, of the bus seats, uh, and then Keith uh, on the uh, technology adoption, and then uh, Jeff uh, on the actual um, uh, uh, development of the network and also infrastructure for China. Uh, Gary? Thank you. So uh, actually, uh, as a, a biggest commercial uh, vehicle operator in Hong Kong, we have been trying uh, electric buses or electric vehicles for many years. Uh, we have faced many challenges, and we know that we have to act very fast because uh, with the roadmap setting at uh, a net 2050, uh, a net zero in 2050, we have to act very fast because each franchise bus, franchise bus have to be in operation for 18 years. So if you calculate, it's like we only have around 10 years to turn our whole fleet, start to turn our whole fleet to a full electric fleet gradually. So, uh, but uh, if you ask me like two years ago, probably I would still have doubt because of the uh, driving range of, uh, as Dr. Janet said, the driving range of different challenges we're facing. But actually the technology has been advancing very quickly for uh, the past two or three years. With the very uh, latest technology in battery, we are now very confident that uh, 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 the, the uh, electric vehicle is a sustainable solution uh, in the very coming few years. So uh, I think with the support from the government in uh, different areas, we are, we are very happy to try in uh, the short future to convert our fleet gradually uh, to a full electric fleet. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Keith? Okay, thank you. So, I'll be focus more on the vehicle adoption. 
Uh, EV charges actually is just one of our initiative to support the decarbonization. Uh, actually, Siemens is doing all things uh, in all around, I can say, starting from smart infrastructures, we are uh, supplying something from source, we are supplying the green initiative from the grid side, we are supplying from smart building, energy storage, as well as EV charging and a customer-centric solution. So in Europe, you can say it's a term of uh, microgrid enabled smart charging. So it's a combined source approach to maximize the electricity supply for all the electrical vehicles rather than just focusing on one source. And then in addition to this kind of uh, concept, we also interest to maybe introduce the high power charge solution, the panel charge solution, which we have some experience in Hong Kong. We discussed with uh, the local universe operator how we can provide this fast charge solution to enable the battery capacity charging uh, up to 80% within a few minutes. This will be a, one of our initiative, our roadmap uh, to support the decarbonization strategy in Hong Kong. Thank you. Uh, Cliff? Yeah. Uh, I'm Cliff uh, from Hong Kong U Power, uh, one of the uh, leading uh, charging service provider and uh, charging operator in Hong Kong and China. And uh, uh, we are uh, very happy to uh, have uh, uh, meet uh, Secretary Wong, uh, who has uh, given the speech uh, about the uh, uh, new roadmap uh, about the uh, electrification of the vehicles, and also set the target for the public vehicles uh, uh, to be uh, banned in, uh, uh, to stop the, the new registration of the ICE vehicles uh, for the public car. But, of course, uh, it's not uh, for, for the commercial vehicle. I, I mean, you know that there is uh, a lot of difficulties, uh, uh, as uh, Lawrence uh, has already uh, presented. Uh, uh, representing for the uh, charging infrastructure in this uh, panel discussion, I think uh, the most challenging uh, uh, problem for uh, the commercial vehicle is uh, one of the, the things is the housing cost is very high. Uh, I think uh, the, the government may have uh, some more subsidies and as well as uh, uh, some other uh, uh, financial schemes uh, that uh, they can consider. And another is um, uh, the uh, lack of the availability of the electrical models, um, just, such as the buses, uh, the double desk buses. Uh, we, we know that there are some new trials uh, uh, that we are looking for. And uh, I, but however, the, the most difficult uh, issue I think is the charging infrastructure. Uh, different from those uh, public vehicles. Uh, for the commercial vehicles owner, they are uh, far uh, less possible to own their own parking space for charging. So uh, we, we need uh, some more public uh, charging infrastructure uh, uh, for, uh, for, for the promotion uh, or the, uh, for, for the facilitation of the transition for the commercial vehicle in this area. So, uh, and also, uh, other than the uh, of the recharging uh, in the high power, um, let's say the pentacle charging or even the flash charging, and um, we also have to consider the open light charging solution as well. And um, accounting for the uh, total number, uh, there's 860,000. Uh, commercial vehicle in Hong Kong, actually, uh, uh, consisting the taxi buses as well as uh, the uh, uh, good vans. Uh, um, if the, we have to cater such a uh, large amount of the vehicles for overall charging, we have uh, maybe uh, for a rush estimation, we have to have uh, some uh, more than a hundred thousand of charging points, which has to be uh, installed in the coming maybe ten years in order to make the transition possible. I think it is one of the roadmap and with the, some triggers I can uh, give up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Now, uh, I would go, like to go back to um, Gary. Uh, now, um, for your planning, um, then what are the major uh, obstacles um, and issues that you are facing in terms of um, uh, creating a charging uh, uh, platform for the uh, uh, electric buses, your bus fuel? And uh, also, uh, as Secretary Wong mentioned um, earlier, the government is committed to achieve um, net zero 2050. Now, uh, with that, of course, uh, then we have uh, various uh, EP supporting schemes, uh, which, for example, for, um, we have the new energy transport fund, and then we have the 180 million 
dollars uh, allocation for procurement of electric buses for uh, child rides. Uh, how has um, KMB been uh, using that? Now, um, these are two very simple questions, but last time when I was talking with Gary, um, we had an hour long discussion on that. <laughs> so how, see how good you are at in um, turning that into five minutes. Yeah, so uh, as I said, I, I really thanks to the government for supporting us on different issues, like the, including the new energy transport fund. So the past year is actually different initiatives like the hybrid buses, like the super capacitor buses as well as factory electric buses have been trialed. And uh, uh, to be honest, um, for the single deckers, uh, factory electric buses is one of the, the best options among the, the, the different trials. Uh, as I said, uh, we have to act very fast because of the life of the fr uh, franchise buses to be 18 years. Uh, but uh, I'm very happy to see the technolog technological advancement as we have very good relationship with the uh, bus manufacturer they actually give us very complex, I mean, uh, a very new technology that um, say now for double decker buses, uh, I'm very confident that they can build new buses with good air conditioning that can run with a driving range of over 250 kilometers. Although Dr. John may have mentioned that many of our buses uh, have a driving range, say a daily driving range of over 300 kilometers, but I'm not talking about switching our whole fleet overnight. Uh, say in five years, if we uh, all purchase our uh, replacement with electric vehicles, it's possible. So the problem is not on the rolling stock now, because government support because of the technology is possible now. The, the key challenge is lying on the charging network. Uh, we have to, uh, as Clifford said, we have to charge a lot, a lot of vehicles overnight. Many of our depots are built like 20 or 30 years ago. So the electricity supply may not be able to support the charging. If we have to change uh, the infrastructure of, of our existing depot, probably we have to sacrifice a whole story of our existing depot to convert into a substation. So this is a very challenge, a big challenge for uh, a bus operator, to be honest. So, uh, uh, of course, we are working uh, together closely with the government and also the electric company to see how we can get solutions there. This is the main obstacle. Of course, we can charge it outside of our depot. We can do it in, say, our bus terminals or some other uh, on-street things. But then uh, uh, we are very happy, say, for the uh, public transport interchange today. That is, that is being planned. Uh, electric charging bays are already there, but probably we are talking about four or five years later. So for the uh, existing public transport change, although we, which is going to be commissioned very quickly, uh, we are still, we, they are there through the challenges and we have to work very closely. But I'm sure we can work out something there that uh, we, we still have time. We have to, we have to act fast, but we're not saying that we have to act tomorrow. So uh, I'm sure that it's something we can work uh, in the next two or three years. Thank you, Gary. Now, um, the user has... Now, the user... Yes. I think... Now, um, Gary, the user has um, spoken on actually the challenge that they are facing. And I think uh, for Keith and uh, for uh, Cliff, uh, both of you probably have partially answered. Maybe I'll go to Keith first. Uh, now, Keith, uh, you have a, a number of different projects going on here in Hong Kong. Uh, for example, you have the uh, green, light, uh, green light bus um, trial uh, going on. And also earlier, you mentioned about different technology. Uh, for example, microgrid enables uh, smart charging, opportunity charging, high power charging. Now, uh, I'm sure you have a lot of experience uh, in the European market. Um, now, uh, anything that you could share in terms of helping with the user, helping with the Hong Kong uh, situation? Yeah, okay, let me try something. <laughs> the space and the electricity constraint are quite common happen uh, in the diverse cities, very similar to Hong Kong, London, and some cases. <laughs> In London, we are planning to achieve the zero emission in 2027. 
And then now we are helping them to increment the uh, depth of charging solution for the 400 pieces of uh, double catalysis. So uh, they are using the e depth software to help them manage the depth of the overview of the charging facilities. Uh, vehicle status so as to adopt the optimal charging approach. This would be a good tool for them for the panels how to schedule their charging facility effectively. And in Berlin, in addition to the depth of charging, they also implement four sets of uh, 600 kilowatt DC charges as, as pencil bulb solution on wood. So that this can overcome them for especially for the long distance driving. So this might not be fully applicable in Hong Kong, but uh, we can also share this kind of example. Maybe we can implement in, a, in some space uh, where some depot which has a big, uh, larger location. So the EBUS can adopt this uh, alternative charging, maybe in airports, maybe some uh, new developed uh, bus depot. And other than that, uh, in Cipriano and the uh, Sino shopping mall in Italy and Finland, they adopt the microgrid charging enable uh, a smart charging enable approach. This consists of the distributed energy optimization platform, the demand response systems, e car operation center, PV monitoring together with the battery monitoring system. So, as a conjunction and in combination of the energy stocks, so you can consider that the electricity capacity is much improved other than just feeding from the grid side. Then the operators can maximize their charging capacity to the different UV uh, if, it's, if it's needed. As a challenge, what we anticipate, uh, or what I can also foresee in Hong Kong, just reference to the uh, use case in overseas would be the holistic approach, what I can say. Because the technology can maximize benefit, this, this is a complete and tight-chain approach. But in Hong Kong, there are too much stakeholders, I can say. Not only talking about the government's utilities. We are on. just take a reference as a commercial sector, commercial building. We have the facility management operator, end users, UPC contractors, subcontractors. All of them have their own interests, especially in terms of the dollar, dollar sign. So how we can maximize such benefit will be already charged to, to the uh, technology suppliers. And one of the biggest challenge I also face uh, when I implement the high power charge solution uh, in uh, Green Labors would be the, uh, what Lawrence no also talked about, the manpower. Because conventionally, vehicles is an uh, engineer field which more in mechanical focus. But now we are implementing the electricity side into these vehicles. And how we can bridge the gap between mechanical and electrical would be a gap. Another would be the control, because when we are talking about uh, demand response, uh, the IRC one, well, IRC communication protocol, this would require the communication engineers. So as a combination, mechanical, electrical, and control. So the manpower would be a really a biggest challenge I can foresee or anticipate in Hong Kong implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, it's very true that whenever there are any changes in terms of technology or mode of operation in industries, uh, training of the talents uh, will always be uh, uh, a big item to tackle. Now, uh, Keith, um, what about your experience in mainland China? You have over 20,000 uh, charging points set up inside of mainland China already. Uh, any do's and don'ts that you think um, your mainland China experience could be applied here in Hong Kong? Uh, we have uh, already installed uh, more than uh, 22,000 of charging points in China and located in 30 cities in uh, different programs. And of course, uh, most of the uh, train stations are just uh, uh, for providing the charging service to those public cars. Um, but uh, uh, I, I think it is uh, something similar that uh, uh, to manage just uh, very scalable uh, charging points and uh, very predictable uh, 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 charge traffic. Uh, I, I think it is uh, somehow we, we can leverage uh, to uh, be used uh, for the commercial vehicle uh, such as the bus fleet. Uh, uh, for the bus operator, actually for the bus uh, operation, there's a very, uh, I can say, very routine uh, operation needs. 
And uh, uh, for for that, uh, just get me said, uh, not not only the, the 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 fast charging can help, uh, but also the overlay charging is uh, very uh, uh, very important for for supporting the last week operations. Uh, as we all know, uh, even for the uh, fast charging, there's a lot of uh, technical uh, difficulties uh, nowadays, uh, no matter for the battery, uh, for the high power charging, uh, no matter for the, 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 the uh, DMS or some other system. And also the infrastructure normally for the high power charging involves some more spaces. Uh, and also the power availability uh, is an issue for the existing the PTI, I can say. And um, but for the overlay charging, uh, you normally can have a, a slower uh, a speed charging, uh, simpler technology, but in a very scalable uh, amount uh, that uh, may be uh, much more uh, suitable for the uh, 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 the whole fleet to be uh, 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 transit to be the, the uh, transition to be the electrical uh, vehicles, uh, and. Uh, um, but of course, for in the PTI, we, we have to still have uh, some more uh, high power charging uh, facilities, which can extend the range of the vehicle, maybe uh, in, in the range of the 100 kilometer in less than uh, one hour to uh, make it uh, possible to keep the uh, vehicles running uh, in the daytime and go back to the depot for the overnight charging and, and then uh, to have another day's uh, business. I, I think it is one of the uh, a key issues we can uh, think about. Right. Thank you. Yes, um, now um, time actually is already running out. Um, we've got three more minutes left. Now, uh, I think maybe what we can do is um, earlier when I was in the discussion with Cliff, um, you mentioned about the, uh, the kind of like a triangle mm -hmm. space, um, financial resources, uh, and also electricity. Now, uh, some of those questions from the audience actually uh, are related to this also, for example, uh, how green is electricity in use it um, and, and different things. So maybe in these three elements, um, I'll just let you three to have um, uh, an interaction uh, on um, how to overcome these issues. Um, now, for example, uh, financial resources actually um, earlier, um, um, my colleague Andy has mentioned about different schemes from the government in terms of relieving that pressure. Uh, but what about the other two? Yeah, to be honest, uh, electricity in the target is a big obstacle, but I, I'm, I'm sure we can uh, uh, overcome it, with, especially if we have a scale to <laughs> try to set. So we're not looking to uh, try like two or three vehicles in the coming years. I think with a scale, like we want to deploy our electric buses like in a new development area. For example, to make it a green community, so to tr really try what it, what, uh, uh, what is the key challenges when we do the deployment. This is how we're looking. To. I think space would be the one of them. Well, I can say within this three three points, space would be the biggest challenge. What I can say because uh, from the electricity supply point, we are we have a lot of solution packages. We have the microgrid technology, the battery, and even uh, we can discuss with. The utilities, if there's any possibility on the power supply, the space is a constraint, especially for scary uh, space that the old that for more than 30 years. Mm -hmm. So it might be quite some technology breakthroughs, uh, for example, the compact substation or the uh, package substation, which can limit the space so that you can maximize your charging space so that you are more uh, encouraged to have this kind of charging facility within your debt. Otherwise, if your deck was full of the electricity substation, yes, no, yeah, no, there's a lot of for you to park. To me, uh, I, I, I have the same uh, in my mind that the space uh, should be the most uh, critical issues. Uh, for the other two, I, I, we, we can say that for the fi financial issue, is that we, we can uh, have a very clear uh, income projection, uh, the demand, okay. Uh, therefore, maybe all the buses to be uh, electrified, we can calculate the income and then we can do a lot of things uh, uh, for, for the investment. But uh, even for the, the power availability, we are not talking, uh, we have to change all the bus uh, to be EV tomorrow. We still have time to plan, although it, it takes years, maybe five or 10 years. Uh, but the, the land uh, it involves a lot of different kind of stakeholders. Uh, especially for those PDI, uh, there are different kind of uh, departments from the government or even uh, 
uh, for installing those uh, high power charging. Uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, maybe the resident just near the resident, they may have uh, uh, some uh, adverse uh, feeling about the dangerous uh, issues or uh, some other uh, emission issues. Uh, I think uh, uh, to to make the Hong Kong to be more uh, sustainable, to be more greener in, in the uh, transportation, we need all the stakeholders to think about it. And uh, of course, I think uh, even Siemens or some other big manufacturer, we, we will provide our uh, technology advancement to make all the things safe and also the, uh, to make it uh, uh, operationally uh, eco-friendly. Um, but uh, for the space, I, I think, uh, especially for the uh, public transportation, we may need some more help from uh, Secretary Wong <laughs> to, to, uh, 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 to coordinate uh, among the departments and to see how, uh, what we can do to uh, make the uh, uh, charter facilities uh, uh, more, uh, in, in much a short, shorter time, uh, we can make it possible uh, other than just uh, uh, we take uh, more than maybe uh, three to five years uh, to, to just launch one charging station. And it, it, it may be too far uh, for us uh, to make it uh, possible to change all the GMB fit uh, uh, to be electrified if, if uh, we, we, we just do in this, this space. Right. Um, thank you. Now, uh, actually, the time is up, uh, but I would like still to use uh, 30 seconds um, to throw a question, a yes and no question uh, to the panelists. Um, that uh, how confident are you uh, for us, Hong Kong as a whole, working together to achieve um, zero uh, vehicular emission by 2050 and also uh, achieving net zero 2050? For franchise process, I'm very confident. Be honest. Yeah, and now I'm saying that the, 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 uh, very soon we can do it uh, financially sustainable, viable. This is, a, I mean, comparable between the diesel bus and the electric bus. So I don't see a big problem if we, if we have the commitment to it in 2050. Yes, I think uh, I'm quite confident that this is an achievable target because we are lucky to met the government, utilities, and all citizens are raising this kind of awareness. We have the combined cycle plan to use the carbon emission. We have the decentralized uh, generation. So I think um, if we are all in the same way to commit ourselves, we have no any problems to achieve this S0 2050. Yeah, uh, I, we are very confident that uh, uh, Hong Kong, uh, which is uh, very suitable for EV, uh, running in, uh, day, in daytime, day to day. -day. And, uh, and also we have no doubts for the private vehicles as uh, there's a lot of uh, subsidies as well as uh, uh, the charging infrastructure are already there. And also we have a plan already. And for the commercial vehicle, I think if the charging uh, infrastructure will be there uh, very soon, uh, it is not a problem. Uh, we, we can accept a lot of the investment as well as the operator to choose it. Actually, it is uh, much more economical. And uh, for for a businessman, I, I don't think uh, it is not a good say, good way to do. Thank you, and uh, I think that concludes our panel today. I think that uh, we are able to um, share the information and also end in a high note. So um, hopefully next time um, when we have this session again, we will have different kind of uh, progress and updates. And there are actually a lot of uh, good questions in the Q and A um, uh, session. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to deal with it. Uh, but then I think um, actually um, for PEC um, or there will be a channel which uh, could be followed up on the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes the webinar. An event feedback questionnaire will be after the webinar. Please take a few moments to fill in the forms. If you're interested to know more about future BC events, please follow our social media channels. Thank you again for joining us today and have a nice day.